good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us. Thank you so much um, for joining uh, us today for this important conversation and this important topic. My name is Abby Evans. I'm the Chief Policy and Advocacy Officer at Mentor. And if you are unfamiliar with us, uh, Mentor is a national nonprofit focused on expanding quality mentoring opportunities for young people. We do that in a host of ways. Some of those are research, uh, quality improvement, training and technical assistance, most of which is handled by our amazing affiliates across the country. We do PR and marketing campaigns, policy and advocacy. We have some tools and resources and guides. Um, we do lots of things, but all focused on expanding those relational opportunities for young people. Um, Today's webinar is part of Mentor's annual Advocacy August campaign. And as the name suggests, we uh, host this camp campaign every year to um, educate, inspire, and activate grassroots who care about youth mentoring and youth development broadly. Um, August is actually a really great time to engage with your elected officials. Um, uh, we started this campaign several years ago, specifically in August, because, for example, August is what is typically known as August recess at the U.S. Congress. You might think that means members of Congress are on vacation, but what it actually means is they're back home in their congressional districts. They're holding meetings in their offices. They're doing ribbon cuttings. They're at site visits at programs like yours. They're um, holding town halls. <clears throat> they're, um, uh, you know, at, at parades <laughs> that are happening throughout the month. And in election years, like this one, they're back home uh, campaigning for re-election as well. The goal for them is to get in front of as many constituents or con constituent representatives, i.e. voters, as possible throughout the month. So this is a really great time to engage. This year for Advocacy August, we made each week a different theme. And this, this week's theme is um, a civic and voter engagement. So <laughs> we're we're in good company and we're having a, a, we're gonna have a really great conversation today. We have a packed agenda. So I just have a few light slides till we get to the exciting part of the agenda. So um, I have some information here pulled from a study released, I think two years ago now by the independent sector, who if you're unfamiliar with is an advocacy organization focused on the needs of the nonprofit sector broadly. So they're actually a really great resource for some of you. Um, but I thought this quote was really valuable. Um, America is stronger when nonprofits and the communities they serve are at the table shaping the public policies that directly impact them. Nonprofits and the communities they serve is really the, the part of this that jumped out at me. Nonprofits play a really unique and important role in communities. Sometimes nonprofits are hyper local, right? It's it's um, never a, a coincidence, for example, when a food bank opens its doors in a community that is you know, food insecure. Um, they go there because that's where the need is greatest, where there is an unmet need that they can help fill. And nonprofits traditionally serve this role. Um, you might think if you, uh, am, as I'm guessing many of you are, come from a youth serving nonprofit, you might think that you know, your your perspective and the role that you play is a little different, um, but actually, at the very least, you, you're providing amazing resources and benefits of all kinds, both to the families and the young people you're serving. But at the very foundational, per, perhaps at the political level, you're providing an economic support that is critical for communities to succeed. So um, nonprofits, all shapes and sizes, are doing really, really important things. Two of the statistics I have listed here that I pulled from the report, I think, however, demonstrate a concern I have and many of us share about the role of nonprofits uh, because they're so important and because they're so integral and because they're so respected by communities, um, they have an opportunity to use their voice to speak for and with the communities they represent, but also to help make positive change. Unfortunately, um, over the last two decades or so, um, we're seeing that nonprofits have less confidence in what it is they're allowed to do legally as tax exempt nonprofits. This first bullet, the 32% bullet, um, focuses on advocacy broadly, what they can do throughout the year, um, helping uh, educate elected officials about the impact of a policy or an issue or challenges that the nonprofit is facing. That's advocacy. Advocacy isn't inherently partisan or political, it's educational. And the second bullet is specifically about nonpartisan voting activities. Um, there's uh, only one in nine, pro not one in five nonprofits are doing this kind of thing, um, sharing voter registration deadlines or encouraging staff and volunteers to vote and sharing a link to do so. Um, but I understand, uh, you know, at a time when everyone, everything seems um, 
visible and there's an increased scrutiny on everything that's happening just because of the advent of social media and the internet and news and information sharing is so easy and so quick um, that nonprofits might be a little skittish, right? And not wanting to accidentally, unintentionally sort of step over that line. The good news is there's some simple rules uh, for nonprofits to follow that, uh, and I'll, I'll point you to a resource or two later that we can talk about. But for just a moment, I wanted to pause and specifically talk about you serving nonprofits. And we're gonna hear from a young person and then uh, the perspective of some folks who engage with young people through their respective agencies later. Um, the bullets here all list different ways that young people benefit when the programs they're engaged with um, are, are engaging them in civic and voting, voter, edu uh, voter engagement and education activities. Um, just like, uh, you know, youth serving organizations have um, emphasized the importance and value of youth voice over the last decade or so that, you know, that was sort of a newish concept maybe 15 years ago and is now widely accepted as not only valuable, but critically important. Um, it, it, uh, and how some nonprofits, <clears throat> excuse me, see the value in helping young people explore different career trajectories and the um, how you get the pathway to get there. And uh, maybe that's a four-year college uh, uh, pathway. Maybe that's a very different pathway. Um, you're, it's all about exploring curiosity um, and opportunity. We need to think the same way about um, civic and voter education and engagement with young people. This last bullet is one I really wanted to double click on. There's a great deal of skepticism out there, understandably. Um, uh, I think just about anyone under the age of 30. I'm sure there are some people over the age of 30, but especially folks under the age of 30. I think uh, question whether uh, anyone's single vote actually makes a difference. I personally know that's that, that it does. Um, I also know that if one person thinks that, 150 other people think that. And if you don't think 150 votes matter, boy, are you wrong. That can make such a difference um, in in it, uh, I see that every day in voting here in Congress, right? The one vote literally can make a dis difference. 150 votes most definitely would make a difference. Um, but also I think there's a great deal of skepticism about the efficacy of our democratic process. And that's something that we should all be concerned about and thinking about what are the ways my youth serving organization or the work I do with a young person, whether it's your neighbor, your mentee, if you're a teacher or a coach, what are the ways that you can be having these conversations and helping young people be curious about what um, civic engagement and voting means in our country? So I mentioned a moment ago that we have some resources to make available to you. These are both free and can be downloaded um, from Mentor's page. I think someone's probably going to drop them into the chat for you. The first one here, the do's and don'ts document we created this year. Um, it's a really quick hit document. Um, some things for that you can do, some things you shouldn't do, <laughs> that you cannot do. Um, but I think if you look through the list, you'll actually be inspired and see that there are some small uh, you know, acts that you can put in place, some uh, small uh, decisions and actions you can put in place um, that that might make it easier for your staff or volunteers to vote on election day or to uh, have a conversation with young people in your program about voting or one of the issues that the candidates are discussing. The second uh, resource is our youth-led advocacy guide. And as the name suggests, um, was created in part uh, by a committee of young people, one of our former colleagues and some of our affiliate leaders. And this guide, which we released last Advocacy August, was designed for two specific audiences, for young people themselves, so that they could explore different kinds of power, how they could think about ways that they could use their voice with more efficacy, how they could source, they could seek out other um, advocacy organizations or groups that care about the issues they care about, but also for programs and folks, work, uh, adults working with young people. What are the some intentional steps they can take to better support youth-led activities? Um, and throughout that guide, there are some uh, uh, interesting discussions and um, uh, passages on both civic engagement and voting. Um, and the two illustrations here I pulled from the guide are uh, the illustrator, the, the artist, Maite, such a talent and the guide is so beautiful. So I encourage you to take a, a look at those when you get a chance. Finally, um, if there's one takeaway I hope you get, you get from today's webinar, um, it's that all of us should be sharing far and wide um, upcoming voter registration deadlines in our respective states. 
um, and ways that folks can reliably check on their voter, uh, voter registration status and or register to vote. Um, I have two great examples of reliable resources right here on the page. There are others. These are just two of them. Um, Nonprofit Vote is a really reliable resource, and the Election Assistance Commission is actually a federal agency. When you click on that link, it will show you a map. You click on your state, it will take you directly to the agency responsible for voting in your state where all of the information you need will be available. And I just want to pause and say I, I really emphasize reliable um, link because, unfortunately, we've seen an uptick this year in folks who are very intentionally trying to trick people into thinking that they are registering to vote when in fact they are not. They are following a link that's presented to them as a voter registration site. The, their information is collected, but they are not being registered to vote. So we don't wanna accidentally share any of that information. So um, these are two great uh, examples, but if you go to your agency, your state's agency for voting, that is one of the most reliable ways you can, you can share a voter registration link. And I encourage you to do that. Um, so that's the end of my little uh, presentation here. And we're going to jump right into the heart of our conversation. I'm going to invite um, Maddie uh, to uh, turn on her camera. Maddie is joining us from Boys and Girls Clubs of Generational Empowerment. And I'm so excited to have you with us. Maddie, take it away. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Madison R. from the Boys and Girls Club of Generational Empowerment in Española, New Mexico. I'm a veteran's daughter a soccer player, a baker, I am a change maker. I am here today advocating for teens and children to see themselves as being a part of the solution and using their voice to bring about change in our communities. When most people think about issues in their community, state, or country, they automatically assume the only people who can solve those problems are elected officials. And when teenagers think about elections, they assume the only people who have a voice are adults who can vote. However, in the past few years, I have come to realize that we can all be a part of the solution in a number of different ways. Although I am too young to vote, my peers and I still have a strong voice in the electoral process. I'm Madison R., a 17-year-old high school senior at Puaque Valley High School and a 14th generation New Mexican from Española, New Mexico, a small town in the northern part of my state. For the past two years, I've had the honor of working at the Boys and Girls Club of Generational Empowerment providing a safe environment for students while helping to lead them as a youth mentor. I want to thank Jay Abeta, the club's CEO, who encouraged me and so many other students in my community to get involved in the election process. My community is rich in Native American and Hispanic culture and prides itself as the lowrider capital of the world. And although there are so many beautiful things that make up my community, it has its problems. A large number of children in the area live at or below the poverty line, with many of them being raised by their grandparents, as drug addiction has taken far too many far too soon. A large number, oh, so sorry. When I realized that my community faced these challenges, I asked myself how I could become a part of the solution. That's when I decided to apply at the Boys and Girls Club of Generational Empowerment. I made it my mission to be a positive role model to clubbers. I believe in the club's mission of enabling all young people, especially those who need us the most, to reach their full potential as productive, caring, and responsible citizens. It's also when I decided to get involved in a statewide election in New Mexico and volunteer on Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham's re-election campaign. I joined a few other teens in my community to take to the phones, calling registered voters, asking them to support our candidate, informing them of Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham's continued support for the legislation that benefited children in our area. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham uh, was so, sorry, excuse me, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham was so, I'm so sorry, hang on, give me a second to collect myself. Our phone banking led the governor to jump right in and start calling alongside us. Before the governor left, she and I had a conversation. We talked about my work at the Boys and Girls Club of Generational Empowerment, my goals, and even what it means to be a female Hispanic leader. As she was about to walk away, she asked, Madison, one day would you like to be governor? I smiled and said, with all due respect, Governor, I think Senator Leo Jaramillo can be governor, and I will become the senator. We hugged, and she said I'd make a great senator and eventually governor. I've also worked alongside my local city council candidate, Joseph Salazar, in this election year because he has been a champion for the Boys and Girls Club in and out of our state capitol, and for his constant presence in our community, I committed to working alongside Senator Leo Jaramillo in his re-election campaign. Although many teens, like myself, may not be able to vote in the upcoming general election, our voices and actions can be a vital part of the political process. Youth can contribute to political engagement, and with your support, we can contribute to conversations about what's important this election year. 
A few of us at the Boys and Girls Club of Generational Empowerment had the opportunity to interview Senator Leo Jaramillo for our club's podcast, Voices of Tomorrow. The podcast is a part of our club's Think, Learn, Create, Change project, which is focused on increasing young voter awareness in our communities and letting our listeners learn about leaders in our area. We asked him questions about his Senate race, what it means to be the only gay senator in New Mexico, and we also touched on issues that are important for teens. We were able to hear firsthand his take on issues in our community and to offer him some solutions from his team constituents. In upcoming elections, you can find me continuing to support candidates who I believe will have the greatest effect on subjects I'm passionate about. I've also pledged to team up with the Santa Fe County Clerk's Office this coming school year to host a voter registration drive at my school. Once teens realize they have the resources, support, and a voice in their community, they will feel empowered to let it be heard, which is why I'm challenging you today to educate, empower, and elevate youth voices this November and beyond. In closing, I want to let you know that I will continue to let my voice be heard, and upon graduation, I plan to attend college, where I will major in neuroscience, minor in political science, intern for an elected official, and one day run for office. I'm Madison R., and I'm going to change the world. Maddie, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. And I have absolute confidence that you are going to achieve every one of those pledges. Uh, future senator in the works, no doubt. Um, and all the great things you'll do along the way. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's wonderful. Thank you for having me. Of course. So um, we're going to keep this going. Um, uh, I hope Maddie inspired all of you as much as she inspired me. Um, we're going to move on to our uh, panel, for lack of a, a better word. Um, uh, Nivia, Krishnan, and Pam Wen, if you would like to turn on your cameras and join us. Um, each of our speakers is going to give uh, a bit of a presentation. And once both of them are done, uh, then we'll do a little Q&A. Um, we encourage you to, to drop some questions into the question box at the bottom of your screen, if time allows, we'll try to get to them. But if you'd like to include your email address, we could also follow up with you after the fact. So thank you both for joining us today um, and for this topic, which I know both of you are really passionate about. Um, Nivia, I'm going to invite you to go first. Awesome. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, thank you to Mentor for the invitation um, to speak. It's so good to meet all of y'all. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll jump right into it. Um, a bit about me before I start the presentation. My name is Nivia Krishnan. Um, I am the executive director of New Voters. We're a national nonpartisan 501c3 focused on high school civic engagement. So our main programming is that we work with high school student leaders and give them all the resources and training that they need to run high impact voter registration drives at their school. Um, I'm also a member of Gen Z. I'm 22. Um, I also just, I just graduated from USC in Los Angeles um, back in May. Fun fact is that the LA Coliseum, which is the place where all of our football games are, that we're going to be hosting LA 28. Um, just thought that was a fun fact because the Olympics just finished. At least the Olympics, Paralympics are still happening. Um, but that all being said, um, jumping into the presentation, wanted to walk through a bit about what New Voters is, what we do, um, and also give you all some ways to get involved. I know we kind of have a big a good mix of different types of um, attendees for the webinar. So I'll do my best to try and give all of you um, ways that you can help promote the youth vote. So the problem that New Voters is trying to address is this idea of how many young people are eligible to register to vote versus how many actually do. Um, young people are the largest voting block um, and specifically 4 million young people graduate high school every year. And because you have to be 18 to register to vote slash vote um, in an election, that 4 million voters is a huge population. Um, despite there being so many young people able to register to vote, young people historically have the lowest voter turnout in elections. Thankfully, this is on the come up. Uh, young people have been turning out increasingly um, since the 2020 election, but we still largely see this untapped potential of getting young people to turn out and vote. This is only amplified for low income voters and young people from low income areas, which means that the mission to try and engage young people is really, really important. Um, yeah, as we can see, young people are very underrepresented and underserved in our democracy, primarily because we don't have that seat at the table. And in this case, the seat at the table is the right to vote, because obviously we're too young to run for elected office. The next best thing is making sure that every single young person is registered and has all of the information they need to be able to register to vote, independent of what their um, political beliefs are. 
So that kind of leads us to our mission. Uh, we're the largest high school slash youth led voting organization in the country. We started in 2017 as a high school club in Berwyn, Pennsylvania. That's where our founder, John B. Rao, um, really saw this, this need to register her peers to vote for the upcoming election. Um, and that's kind of where we got started. So we like to highlight that origin story because it really speaks to our commitment to making sure our efforts are always youth led. All of the people that run new voters on the national level, we're all members of Gen Z. Um, and our organization is 98% high school and college students. John V and I are the only exceptions to that, uh, which I think is pretty special. Our vision is to make sure that every high school student is registered and pledges to vote before they graduate. Um, and accomplishing this will allow 4 million new students to be added to the voter roll every single year, which is amazing. Um, in terms of our reach to date, uh, we launched nationally in 2020. And since then, we've reached around 500 high schools across 40 states, which has been amazing. And our reach is only growing by the day. And we also have a huge network of high school and college students spread out throughout the country that are helping us with our efforts. Um, the way we focus on registering or the way we accomplish this high registration rate is through this sort of pipeline. So the first is identifying a high school leader. Uh, we do this through a combination of, you know, mass publicizing our uh, voter registration program to students and students also find us through our website and Instagram. So that combination of proactive outreach and then just being available allows us to source high school students that really want to make an impact in their school. And we pair them with a college mentor who has been trained on what our registration model looks like, who is there to help guide the high school student, not just through their voter registration drive, but also being there to answer questions about college or just advice about life and options for um, students after high school. And so this peer-to-peer -peer mentorship model really makes us unique. Uh, but in addition to that, we provide a host of resources, basically anything that the student would need to be able to run the registration drive at school, uh, we make sure to provide to them. And I'll get in more into that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, our model really focuses on this kind of four um, so not vote tripling, but kind of the next step after that. Um, so as we move from voter registration, we go to vote tripling. So when it comes time for get out the vote efforts, which will start happening around October, uh, we're kind of transitioning our voter registration drives to having students make sure that all their peers um, that they engaged throughout their registration drive turn out and vote. Um, so making sure that they have that vote tripling plan in place, making sure they have a plan to cast their own ballot, um, and then giving them opportunities to engage with their communities even after this voter registration component. New Voters is a huge believer in comprehensive civic engagement. Civic engagement doesn't just have to be voter registration. It's also engaging in your community through volunteering um, or local advocacy, whatever engaging in your community means to you. Um, and we really believe that. So our goal is when we work with students, it kind of gets them excited about all these other forms of civic engagement as well. Um, yeah, I'll skip, I'll skip past that. But wanted to highlight one of our um, more recent big activation efforts, which was in November of 2023. There was a really important um, Supreme Court election happening in Pennsylvania. Um, and so we led a mass organizing effort. We, we worked with 20 students um, across 11 high schools in Pennsylvania to run voter registration drives at their schools and register people to vote. Um, so it was a big kind of like grassroots relational organizing moment for us. Um, we distributed resources to students. We, we ran these drives in a very short period of time as well. Um, and we ended up activating 600 plus community members in just under a week. Um, so the fact that we're able to, to do this on such an impactful level in such a short amount of time bodes really well for us as we look to what our game plan is for the rest of this election cycle. Um, a couple other things I wanted to highlight about our registration model. Um, obviously, I talked about the mentorship component, um, but also wanted to highlight the resources that we give to students. Um, our resources are really focused on implementation and student-led voter registration. So we are big believers in, hey, if you give students everything they need, they are more than capable of running a really high impact registration drive and are at times even better able to engage their peers um, than school administrators might be able to. Um, so we give them a drive handbook that's really focused on, okay, how can you actually integrate a road, voter registration drive into your school? How do you um, get other students to work with you? How do you get um, administrators on board? How can you work with teachers? How can you make it a fun challenge 
to register people, um, maybe between like different sports teams on campus. Um, so we're really focused on that implementation. We also give a live training every week um, that's run by a new voters team member that walks students through that same drive planning process. Um, and the other really cool thing is we give students a school specific a school specific voter registration link. So students are able to use that link during their registration drive and are able to track their drive progress so they can actually see how many students they're reaching. Um, and it also avoids the potential added difficulties of just having paper registration forms um, by routing people through online registration It makes the drive a lot more efficient. Um, and the final thing we give to students is a physical box of new voters um, merch for them to keep, but then to also use in their drives. Um, so that's definitely an added component of our model is we not only want to elevate student leadership, but we want to reward it. So we give students this physical box of new voters swag. And then after they run their drive, they also get a prize um, for doing it. So we're really trying to create this culture of rewarding students for doing their civic um, engagement work to organize in their community. So our game plan for 2024 um, this these two charts in Pennsylvania and Arizona basically just show the potential um, to really make a difference in the election. Pennsylvania and Arizona are our focus states right now. But that being said, we work with any student that, um, you know, expresses interest in wanting to run a drive with us. Um, but this this action potential is really crucial because the margin by which Joe Biden won in 2020, that's what we're basing this data on. Um, that margin is less than the number of eligible young voters there are in each state, which means that if we're able to register even 50 percent, even 25 percent of the eligible young people in each of these states, that is enough to potentially move the needle in, in the election one way or the other. Um, and that's a really cool thing. And honestly, it's become even more um, common that these margins are super tight as elections are getting more polarized. So that makes voter turnout and voter registration even more crucial regardless of what side you're on. Um, so our goal for 2024 is we want to run 400 registration drives um, with our focus states, again, being Pennsylvania and Arizona. Um, we're well on our way. We have around 150 uh, schools so far signed on with us. Um, and that is really our focus. So really quick, I don't want to go too much over time, but in terms of ways that you can get involved, there's a few. So the biggest way that everyone can help is referring a student to new voters to run a registration drive. So whether this is like a family friends um, kid that you know of or a student that you might work with, um, we welcome any and all students to run a drive with us, which they can do at that link, tinyurl.com slash run a drive or at our website at New Voters. There's a big run a drive button right over there. Um, so that is a big way to help because that is our main programming for high school students and we'd love to reach more students. Um, so that is awesome. And if you're a member of Gen Z, you can also sign up to be a mentor. You can also find information about that um, on our Instagram page. Um, by signing up to be a mentor, um, you would be helping guide our high school students through the drive planning process. And I also wanted to highlight that, obviously, because we're on a mentor-themed call. Um, being a mentor or our mentors are such a crucial part of our process, so definitely wanted to highlight that. Um, if any of you have connections in Arizona or Pennsylvania, um, in terms of whether it's like different stakeholder groups or community groups that you think would be good for us to work with, uh, we always welcome those as well. Um, and then finally, if you're able to, um, you can support our work by donating at our website. Um, but in terms of order of priority, definitely the biggest priority for us is um, engaging as many students as possible. So um, yeah, thank you so much for, for having us. And I'm excited to get into that conversation in the Q&A later. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Nivia, thank you so much. And I not only do I love that you called out mentoring because we're mentor and we care a lot about mentoring, um, I just think this work is so um, so much more effective when it's about relationship development and and you're uh, allowing people to sort of engage with each other. So that's really exciting. And new voters, just I'm so inspired by the work you're doing. I think it's so exciting. And um, four million new voters graduating every year. That's absolutely amazing um, and uh, such an opportunity. Very cool. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Thanks. So I am going to share my screen uh, for Pam. Just give me one second and we'll jump right in. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Abby. Um, 
Good afternoon or hello to everyone, wherever you're dialing in from today. Uh, my name is Pam Ewan. I am the Director of Federal Government Relations Policy and Advocacy with Boys and Girls Clubs of America. And first and foremost, I do really want to give our thanks and gratitude um, to mentor National Abby Caden. Thank you so much, um, not only for having BGCA here today, um, but most particularly giving um, our, our youth, Maddie, um, a chance to um, to really speak and give her keynote this morning. We know um, youth are our future, so really appreciate the opportunity for um, lifting up um, youth voices in, in this and centering youth voice um, always in the work that you all do. Um, so hello to everyone again. Um, I really want to be able to take a little bit step a deeper dive into some civic engagement tactics, um, particularly how we can work together to provide youth and you all as, as um, youth serving organizations with the tools you really need to be civically engaged, especially as we're getting closer to um, a very critical election um, this November 5th. Um, so on the next slide, um, we always start out at BGCA with a little bit of grounding and goals. Um, and really want to highlight throughout the course of this presentation that um, with careful planning, 501c3 organizations can and it really should, especially as you heard from Maddie in her remarks earlier around the election, that with their current and future, uh, especially with youth being um, the current and future elected leaders of this world, um, we know that young people already care deeply, as you saw again from Maddie's um, remarks earlier about people and the issues that are us uh, around them um, and their communities in which they live and go to school in. And so therefore it is a responsibility that we essentially have to not only show our young people how they can inform the opinions of their elected le uh, leaders, but also continue showing elected leaders that their decisions have a profound impact on the young people um, that are in their communities and that they are uh, serving every day and they are representing every day. Um, and so mentors and youth serving organizations, and, and in the case of Boys and Girls Clubs, we can um, have a strong influence on the youth and the people in our communities. So essentially with um, this presentation, really wanted to go into a little bit about how we can help your organizations build and strengthen relationships with elected leaders, essentially engage your young people in the, in the civic and, and political process, um, really want to give some of those tactics and examples of how you can get youth more involved as well in this conversation, and really kind of drive home a, a, a theme about how nonpartisan, and again, Boys and Girls Clubs is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization, but nonpartisan does not necessarily mean non-participatory, and so therefore wanted to help draw out that difference um, in this presentation. So on the next slide, um, we're really going to go into appropriate ways on how 501c3s can get involved. And on the next slide, really just dive in um, on the first tactic that we can think through. So um, candidate forums and town halls is where I wanted to start. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a much, very much a storyteller. So if you can uh, stick with me, um, just imagine if you are living in um, Virginia's 10th congressional district, um, this year that there are no incumbents essentially running in this year's election to, to reassume their seat for re-election again. Um, so there are going to be all new faces and opportunities to learn more about candidates, their positions, and who's really going to be on the ballot and who you're going to be voting for um, come November 5th. Um, but it, it looks like, and again, this is a, a fictional example, but... Um, busing potentially from a school to an out of school time program has potentially been maybe in our imaginary world, um, a program or a an area of concern that many of the constituents in this uh, this Virginia's 10th congressional district are concerned about. Um, and there's a possibility that just because of recent budget cuts, um, they may, may feel that bus uh, routes that are gonna be reduced or even potentially eliminated. Again, a fictional situation, but assuming that you're you're following along with me in this particular story, candidate forums essentially are, our town halls are really are a great chance to take this issue that you as constituents or organizations are really concerned about potentially, and a chance to really bring this um, concern to your candidate, elevated essentially, and a chance for you to really hear from the candidate about how they would essentially address this issue, whether it's a local candidate, a state candidate, or even your federal candidates, again, in this in this fictional case, um, run for office. As 501c3s we, and youth serving organizations, we essentially can participate um, in these candidate forums and town halls or potentially host them as well. But in order to do so, you must provide um, a fair and impartial treatment of all uh, of all candidates. Um, all legally qualified candidates for particular offices um, must be invited, but if they if only one party accepts and the others do not, as long as both parties or all legally qualified candidates um, have been invited, you may continue to engage 
and you must discuss discuss a wide range of issues. So essentially, in addition to this busing concern um, and funding for busing to get to out of school time programs, um, you must discuss, discuss a wide range of issues. Um, presentations of the questions should um, be prepared in a nonpartisan way um, and should be presented identically or nearly identical for every candidate. Again, we're getting on the theme of if one candidate from one party receives ABC, similarly, the other candidate may do so at the same time, and equal time for each candidate must be presented in their view. So again, as a 501c3, if you have a chance, you may either attend and pose this particular question, or if you're looking to host um, your particular candidate forum or town hall, there are different tips and tactics, um, ways for you to be able to engage in a nonpartisan way. On the next slide, we really just get into a little bit, a few tips about how you may be able to successfully host one. Um, in order to think through this um, more strategically um, and all to ensure that you're engaging effectively, always think through in advance, come prepared with that question or comment that most impacts your organization, your mission, or community you represent. So again, going back to that busing concern and funding for busing, really phrase out that question in advance so you're coming in prepared um, sometimes you only have a very short amount of time. So rehearsing that in advance may be helpful. Study and know the background of the individual, the elected official you're speaking to. Um, in my example, it may not really work, but if this is an incumbent that's running for office, look at some of and research some of their positions, vote history, et cetera, committees that they may sit on in order to know how to appropriately form that question. And again, uh, staffer, staffer, staffers. Um, if you don't get an, um, an opportunity to really speak directly with that candidate or an elected official, don't always don't re don't forget, excuse me, um, that you can always engage with one of their staff members um, instead to be able to get some of that information through to key people um, on um, that are directly connected to that individual. On the next slide. Um, we really wanted to also jump to candidate questionnaires. They are also another great way um, to help your youth um, and community become familiar with the candidate as their positions uh, and their positions, um, while also safely engaging with those running for like uh, for public office. Um, so if we return to that busing issue for out of school time programming again, um, this really is candidate questionnaires are really a great opportunity for you to be able to get that candidate on the record about that issue you're most concerned about. Do they support more funding? Do they believe in cutting, unfortunately, um, that funding? How officially on the record in public, in writing, um, do they feel about and how would they take action going forward? Um, this is a chance for the candidate, if they do not know much about your organization, for them to become, uh, become more familiarized with your organization, how many youth do you serve, where are you serving those youth in particular, and the general mission um, of the organization. Um, and in turn, this is a chance for you to be able to, you know, really continue to utilize those tools um, to be able to elevate your position um, writ large with a larger audience. So larger outside of a potential election-based um, strategy, this is a wider chance to really get some um, depth and to, to reach a wider audience um, about the mission of your organization. On the next slide, again, we really just dive into some tips um, about best practices around candidate questionnaires. Um, admittedly, this potentially is a very detailed process. It requires accuracy, it requires precision. And so therefore, for some organizations that may have limited capacity and bandwidth, this may be something you need to think through carefully. That being said, there are many, many nonpartisan uh, 501 so C3 organizations that are definitely engaging and um, putting together candidate questionnaires um, heading into the election. So consider partnering with organizations out there that may have similar missions um, that may be able to divide and conquer some of that bandwidth. Um, and as number two on the second bullet really says here, you're going to need to follow up regularly. Again, this gets to the, the precision, this gets to the accuracy, this gets to the capacity that I was alluding to earlier. But because of that, we are always reminding folks that if you're putting together questionnaires, um, follow up regularly, be persistent to ensure that you are accurately identifying the candidate's position on issues going forward. Um, again, that doesn't preclude you, but things that you need to be aware of when going into qu candidate questionnaires that you cannot do. Again, there's a very fine line sometimes when it comes to um, where you can engage and how you cannot engage. Um, you cannot 
um, use candidate questionnaires and distribute them with the intention of swaying voters um, for or against a specific candidate. Again, this is an educational tool that opens your eyes to both parties and all legally qualified candidates um, that are running for the particular office. You cannot share results with only one candidate responding. You must have all of the answers in both respondents, um, as this would appear to reflect a partisan and support for a particular candidate if you only have one side um, rather than all reflected. Um, one of the things that we typically get when we present and talk about candidate questionnaires is, what if the candidate doesn't respond? Um, which also therefore alludes to that last bullet. It puts you kind of in a lurch. Um, you may, um, and as I think many of the resources that Mentor had put out earlier um, in the chat, you you may be you may and have um, permission to respond um, that the candidate did not respond, um, and you may also include that the candidate's position. Um, if you do a little bit of research um, based upon some uh, neutral and unbiased information from their website or other nonpartisan publicly available sources, um, you may also be able to source um, from those resources or to ensure that you have both and all um, positions resourced before putting out your resources um, to your uh, third parties. Uh, but it's important to always consider footnoting um, wherever you have information. Um, and on the next slide, we really have an example, just really quickly, about what a candidate questionnaire would look like, just some high-level examples, um, and happy to also share going forward more resources about um, example candidate questionnaires and many of the tactics that we have talked through previously. Um, on the next slide, we really wanted to just go into some of the registration tactics. I know Nivea had really Div, uh, dive deeper into a lot of the voter registration tactics. And, and just like Maddie had referenced um, in her uh, presentation earlier, but again, going back to some of my uh, storytelling tips and tricks that I really lean into um, to bring the, put a name and a face to why these uh, voter registration tactics are important. Um, I lean back and think back about the uh, Boys and Girls Clubs of Sarasota and DeSoto counties in Florida where they recently saw um, a problem in their community that the lower um, the lower one third of their um, board reg voter registered voters, excuse me, um, were youth. Um, there was a lower than desired civically participation, particularly in Sarasota County, among the younger demographic, and as Gen Z voters, as teens um, in their local boys and girls clubs. Part of their Think, Learn, Create Change project is what they uh, what they set up essentially is what they call Project Vote. It's a youth-led civic engagement initiative to increase pre-registration for teenagers. And over the past year, their youth council um, has set up informational tables at various community events, really to engage the community and facilitate um, voter registration um, tactics in order to really concentrate on how they can get pre-registration activities, educate teens about when they become eligible, what they should do, and some of those deadlines. So again, going back to the slide and what's on there for you, um, voter registration as a 501c3, just like they're doing at the Boys and Girls Clubs of Sarasota and DeSoto counties, they really can provide that educational material, examples, voter information about how um, to vote in the upcoming election or on ballot measures too. I think one thing that we really haven't to, uh, dive deeper into yet, but voting ballot measures are another area that um, 501c3s can get engaged in. Again, you can share registration deadlines and early voting deadlines, um, locations about polling locations, and partner with other 501c3s. Again, a, a host of other activities to really ensure that youth at an early age can also definitely get involved in that process. Um, but key red flags to think through definitely do not um, ensure that you are not displaying partisan materials or tie your event to a particular um, political party or candidate, as that will definitely cross the line into the areas of not to engage. Um, and then finally, on the next slide, really just wanted to highlight um, one real quick thing that we are really excited about that we stood up this year um, at Boys and Girls Clubs of America, which are our voter pledge cards. Um, a poor graphic, unfortunately, I apologize that I put on this screen, but on the front is our pledge to vote card. On the back, essentially, during our summit for America's youth, when we nearly had um, 500 youth and their adult mentors here in Washington, D.C., we distributed these cards to all the youth and basically said, what is your commitment in July that you're going to take back um, and what are you going to pledge essentially to do um, in 2024? And we had the youth fill out their name, their club, and put their 
um, and we were going to identify their address and they were going to either plug uh, pledge that if they were over 18, they were either going to register and or um, uh, research candidates um, make a plan to vote if they were under 18, which admittedly two thirds of the group that we were working with um, were under the age of 18. They were going to tell three friends to how they can get and work with three friends to essentially engage with um, and, and make a voting plan um, heading into November 5th. We are going to essentially take those cards um, in late September, early October, mail them back to all 500 youth that had participated. And as it gets closer to the election, remind them essentially that this is the pledge you made. And now as we are um, just a month away from election day, this is your commitment that we now want you to follow through on. So voter pledge cards are another tactic that we really encourage um, folks to think through um, should you have that capacity to be able to engage youth in many different ways, remind them about the ways that they can get involved in the election um, this year, whether they are over the age of 18 or under the age of the 18, there are many different ways that they can do so. And just on the next slide, um, really just try to draw out and give you a, an image of what those um, voter pledge cards looked like. We definitely took into consideration the age demographic um, that we worked through. And again, our QR code links to, again, some of those trusted resources that Abby had referred to easier. And we uh, linked to vote.gov um, to be able to ensure that all 50 states in which we were getting reach into um, had their state-specific information. So finally, on the last side, just really want to go through other ways that, you know, 501c3s, can still engage their members of Congress, their elected officials, their candidates this year in that nonpartisan way. Um, as alluded to earlier, and I won't um, go into too much of the details since we already went there, was um, consider always arranging tours of your sites, in our particular case, um, for a Boys and Girls Club clubhouse, um, or participate in ongoing activities, whether that's um, again, a, a picnic or that's, um, you know, an open house forum or a press conference that they're standing up, always definitely consider um, standing up and attending those or inviting those individuals um, to your sites to um, educate them um, about what you are doing um, going forward this summer and then through the fall. Um, and it's always important to make an effort to educate all parties um, that are invited to learn about. So um, all individuals should definitely receive an invitation. Um, and as I had mentioned, participate in public events, send congratulatory letters to newly elected officials. Um, once we know that the results on November 5th, 6th, maybe it'll drag into the 7th just a tad bit, who knows um, these days, but um, definitely consider um, that congratulatory um, letter so that therefore they are aware of your brand, your organization, your mission, and most importantly, how they can get in contact with you um, once they definitely are established and set up and would like to continue engaging in the community. And always um, definitely enga with engaging with young people these days, think through the use of social media um, and how you can definitely consider um, getting that external messaging and communication. And one of the key things that I think we're thinking through and very paying attention to, especially during um, this time about trusted information that we get out there, make sure you are working with a verified or a blue check mark, um, um, you know, campaign or um, um, uh, uh, um, account, excuse me, um, on social media, one that is there with their title, Representative ABC, Congresswoman XYZ, um, to ensure that you are working on their official capacity versus their campaign. That's the difference in the way you could be able to see um, some of those. Um, so with that, I will wrap it up and we'll look forward to working with some of you and hearing more about your questions um, going forward. So thank you again for having me. There we go. <laughs> There we go. Thank you so much. Um, really, really appreciated your presentation. Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you so much, Pam. There was so much really great information in there, and I appreciate you going beyond. I really emphasized uh, voter registration and um, uh, registration dates because I think that's the low hanging fruit. And I think if if there's one thing you take away, that's what I want all of us to take away. But there are so many ways that programs and individuals um, can get involved. Um, one thing you said, Pam, that really jumped out at me that I thought might be valuable for us to just voice over um, is uh, 
uh, I think you framed it as, you know, uh, no partisan gear, I think is the expression you used. And um, I was just thinking how often um, nonprofits bring young people and uh, adults together, whether those, whether those are staff or volunteers. Um, and, you know, like you get up in the morning, you're excited to go do your volunteer activity or go do your shift at the club or wherever else. And you just pull on your favorite t-shirt and then you show up thing and it's, you know, vote for so-and-so. Um, and there's, there's, um, it's really important for nonprofits, not only to think about what they want to do and what they can and can't do, but also to set all the people who are in your universe up for success as well. So just be communicating clearly. It's not, it's not don't wear that t-shirt because we don't like that candidate. It's because we're a tax exempt non nonprofit and we just want to set you up for success. So um, that would just jumped out at me. So um, I think, uh, let's see, which question do we want to go with? Um, you know, both of you, um, gave such really positive and confident ways um, that nonprofits can engage. Um, I wonder if there's any lessons you've learned in your respective, uh, from your respective, respective experiences and lenses um, that you'd want to share with the audience around some of this experience, right? Um, I think um, nervousness and lack of confidence is one of the things that get in the way of, of nonprofits doing more of this work and, and including with young people. So I just wonder if you have any thoughts or or stories you can share about lessons learned? Yeah, I mean, I can start. I think in our work, a lot of it is, a lot of the work we do is with schools. Um, and so we've seen that in terms of the nervousness and hesitation, that's all the more pronounced at schools because schools have become a battleground for a lot of political discourse. Um, so I think justifiably so schools are nervous and administrators are nervous to just talk about politics in general. Um, but I would argue that the solution to remedying the division that we see right now isn't to stray away from political conversations, but is rather to lean into it. Um, because I think it's better to teach young people on how to have productive, informed, well-researched civil discourse than to just not talk and not have conversations in general. So that's kind of the way that we kind of ease schools into it, but I think this could apply to other groups as well, is to lean into this idea of productive discourse. And as long as you're following nonpartisan guidelines, like that is your job. And um, we work with people to make sure that they do that in terms of voter registration. But beyond that, like your commitment to democracy necessitates conversations about politics. Um, so we really, I think we encourage young people, especially also to be very like not apologetic about wanting to have conversations about how to improve their community. And I think another part of it is also bringing it to be very localized. Um, so we try to encourage our students to, you know, not just focus on the federal level um, conversations about policy or about candidates, um, but like really bring it back to issues in your community that you care about, because oftentimes that's a more substantive way to engage your peers while still remaining nonpartisan. Like you can talk about issues that are important to you um, without straying into supporting one political party or another. Um, so I think just really encouraging best practices when it comes to having civil conversation has been one way that we've seen be effective in terms of minimizing nervousness or fear about political discourse. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Nivia, because um, one of the reasons why um, Boys and Girls Clubs of America really centers and over the past couple of years have really leaned into this element of youth voice is because of the multitude of ways that our youth are showing up at our clubs and it's the societal impacts um, that are definitely affecting them all in many different ways, whether that's from their mental health, what are there from environmental injustices, um, the range of issues and the ways particularly that they need those supports and want to be able to vocalize um, that support um, is very, very critical to ensuring that they are healthy um, youth um, and thriving youth moving forward. So it's, I think that one of the many reasons why we've centered um, youth voice and a lot of not only our advocacy, um, but our efforts um, writ large across the movement going forward. Um, that being said, whenever we come back to the political climate, I've I've been in D.C. for um, nearly 15 years now, longer than I'd like to admit. But the political climate is, I think, definitely something that we want to be protective of of our youth, but definitely do not want to stifle them from from thriving in the many ways that we know that they can. 
Um, so I think that's why we we really lean on our wonderful partners at Mentor and a lot of our national um, coalition partners to be able to talk through and help guide us on that fine line on where you can engage and where you can't engage. And again, we don't deny that there's a very fine line on how we can walk and when we can walk. But as long as we we have those resources that are definitely in the chat for you to all refer to, I think there are definitely important. It's important that we continue to um, elevate that youth voice, particularly in these climates and the way that we see youth showing up each day um, going forward too. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, oh, <laughs> Nivia, you just responded to it, but we had a great question in the chat and I wonder if maybe you want to voice over it. Someone was asking, um, uh, how to engage young uh, young folks outside of voting. And and I think they specifically mentioned um, there's a lot of nervousness, right? And getting involved in doing something feels good. It helps sort of combat that anxiety. Um, so uh, Nivia, if you want to voice over what you shared or, or Pam, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on that as well. Yeah, I mean, well, I think one way is kind of just summarizing what I said in the chat. I think those under 18, first off, can do voter registration work. In a lot of states, like you can still get trained on how to register to vote. For example, in Arizona, they have a really cool deputy registrars program where they actually train young people who are at least 16 years old on how like what the Arizona requirements are for voter registration so that those students can then go and run um, highly effective registration drives. So one, I will say there are still opportunities on a voter registration front to get involved. Those at 16 or 17 years old, can in many states pre-register, which has been shown, like research has shown that leads to civic engagement in the long run. But outside of voting, I mean, going back to what I said earlier about what civic engagement can look like, um, it can look like joining your local Boys and Girls Club chapter, like that's a great way. It can look like volunteering at a nonprofit that um, young people might care about. I started volunteering at a music academy when I was in like seventh grade, just like helping out teaching piano in the classroom not to say that I knew much about piano at the time but they let me help out um, and it was a cool way to still get involved with my community so I think also just making sure that young people know that there is that like wide range so aside from voting they can also right now campaign season is huge which means that like if there is a candidate that they like um, whether it's like for state house or whatever level campaigns love volunteers um, and they don't really discriminate based on age so regardless of how old you are like campaigns love to have that young energy so definitely like encouraging them to find a campaign that they might resonate with um but yeah just in general like volunteering is something that young people can always do in a lot of states they also have youth commissions at different levels so I'm referencing Arizona because I'm from here so I like know the landscape a little bit better but like in Arizona they have different city level youth commissions um, where they recruit high school students from across the area they also Arizona has a governor's youth commission recruiting students across the state so there's a lot of like pockets for youth engagement some states have more than others obviously but I think regardless of the state infrastructure at the very least a student can volunteer for an org they care about um Pam I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that question yeah, no, I think I just would plus one to everything that we had mentioned. And I think just go back to um, Maddie's keynote that she had mentioned earlier. She is an example, uh, essentially, of what Nivia had mentioned. She volunteered and did some phone banking um, with her local elected official that she felt most connected with. Um, she is going to you know, start volunteering. And I think what I really wanted to emphasize from her remarks was that um, her club leader was essentially that bridge introduced her to the elected officials, brought her to a lobby day, um, brought her and exposed her to some of the materials on all par uh, Republicans, Democrats, non um, third party candidates, all of the elected officials going forward, um, brought the elected official in to do an interview for their podcast, which therefore opens the doors to her learning more about volunteer opportunities. Now she's going to, you know, double major in political science. She sees a future essentially. So I think it's an example of um, what Nivia had mentioned, those volunteers opportunities do result hopefully in some of these opening these doors um, to youth going forward. So kind of just giving an example to what you yeah. had mentioned. I think so much of Youth Voice, which was um, a through line in both of your presentations and obviously central to Maddie's keynote, um, is often about one in, in, in you know, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Inspiring curiosity, right? Allowing young people to be curious, but also demystifying things. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking this morning, 
I'm, I'm totally dating myself here, but my first voting experience literally was one of those old booths. I walked in, I had to pull a lever and a, and a curtain would close behind me. And there was these man, like metal tabs you had to physically move, right? Yeah. And even today, um, the different experience you have within precincts, within the same community can be entirely different, right? You can have touch screens, you can have bubble forms, you can have other, there's lots of different ways that that young people vote. And that's just about voting. I think so much about um, how to make anyone, because this is not just true of young people, but I would love to inspire some curiosity and interest among young people about like these big policy topics, right? That, you know, what we hear so much from uh, the presidential candidates and folks running for Senate and House and, and governor are talking about things like roads and bridges, like infrastructure projects. And you can understand what they mean by roads and bridges, but what does that mean? Like, what's the granular? What's the neighborhood example? What's the community example? And helping them understand um, what that looks like in your community. And 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 does that change your interest in that? It certainly educates you. And, and, and if not, how can you find an issue that you're really passionate about that you want to inspire candidates to be talking about and really helping them think about this is a this is a two way street. It may feel like the power is entirely on the candidate and the elected official side, but ultimately it's actually about the voters. That's why they are so desperate to get in front of us or avoid us. Right. Sometimes that's the case, too. Um, and and youth voice and and voices of advocates, regardless of age, is really so powerful. Um, so we are at 201, but I, I wanted to ask one question of both of you, if you don't mind. Um, if you had one piece of advice for a young person uh, around uh, today's topic, um, I'm putting you totally on the spot because I didn't prepare either of you for this. What would it be? For a young person, I would say um, always be curious, um, ask good questions, ask smart questions. Um, there are a lot of um, trusting mentors and adults and educators out there um, that are definitely happy to be able to share and expose you um, to new opportunities, um, whether that's you are over the age of 18 and can vote or begin to engage and prepare you for that pipeline to get engaged in that political process going forward. So stay curious, um, ask good questions, ask smart questions, and definitely look forward to um, seeing you on the ballot probably one day too. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely echoing that. Um, I'd say if I had one piece of advice, it'd probably be to like not be afraid to claim your spot um, in every level of conversation, um, regardless of like, don't let your don't disqualify yourself. Um, like, don't think of these barriers as like limitations. Um, but I'd say like, be confident in every space that you walk into. Um, even if it's not a space that was like designed for us to be in, it doesn't mean that like we shouldn't be there. So whether that's being on a campaign and being the youngest person there by like a decade um, or, you know, volunteering somewhere, even though you might not be the most experienced person or whatever it may be, like, don't be afraid to claim your spot. Be like, I'm here. I have something to say. And like what I'm saying, like matters just as much as what anyone else has to say. So I'd say like really claim that. Um, the space that you have and don't be afraid to to lean into spaces even where it might be a little uncomfortable. Two excellent pieces of advice. Thank you both, Pam and Nivia, for uh, joining us today, educating us so much. Please check out New Voters, um, amazing organization. I know I will definitely be paying attention and promoting you all. And uh, Pam uh, and Boys and Girls Clubs of America, thank you so much for all you do and for participating today. Thanks to all of you for joining. Um, I hope that we've inspired you uh, and uh, happy uh, civic engagement. Bye everyone.